The Worldview of Paul Cezanne, A Psychic Interpretation by Jane Roberts. Chapter 1. A Multidimensional Christmas Present and a Request is Answered. What would you like for Christmas, I asked my husband, Rob. A book on Paul Cezanne, the artist, Rob said. We sat at our round wooden table in front of the window. I stared out at the mountains. I should have known for birthdays, anniversaries, or any holidays, Rob always wanted art books or supplies. A domestic moment. I grinned and I said, okay. And nothing told me that this book must have been born in that moment. As I idly smoked a cigarette, and I thought I'd better get down to the art store soon because there were only 20 days or so before Christmas. I mean a really good one, Rob said with mock severity. Oh, well, that makes it harder, I answered. Because while Rob is an artist, I didn't know enough about art or Cezanne to know what Rob meant by a good one. Wouldn't it be great, I thought, to get a book about the dead Cezanne from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I saw one in my hand, a giant coffee table production, rising freshly from the mind of Cezanne, just appearing next to the Christmas tree, and me saying triumphantly, Is that good enough? <laughs> and Rob... Overcome with surprise, laughing his head off, and I just say, ah, uh, Merry Christmas, nonchalantly, or better, with feigned worry. That is what you wanted, isn't it? I mean, a book by Cezanne. The mental fantasy vanished instantly. I for forgot it completely. At least I thought I had. For one thing, while I believe in life after death, I don't at all necessarily suppose that we exist post-death as we do now with just a change of form. We change so constantly in life that sometimes it's difficult to keep track of ourselves. Thoughts that once seemed characteristic at certain times of our lives strike us as so strange later on <laughs> that they might as well have been someone else's. So I didn't necessarily believe that there was a Paul Cezanne, the historic person, just as he was in life, only transferred to a non-physical somewhere else, outfitted with, say, a fabulous studio in the sky or out anywhere. Yet I've certainly had commerce with identities that don't seem to be confined to our kind of reality and can't be pinpointed in time and space as we are. I've discovered that consciousness itself is a far more creative element than we've ever supposed. And it often seems to make loops with itself, leaping in and out of itself in unfathomable fashions. And I do have to admit that I have an unconventional cast of mind or psyche and access to sources of creativity and knowledge that are relatively unusual. Also, Rob and I do routinely include in our domestic life some activities that certainly seem strange to others. <laughs> Once or twice a week we sit down, Rob on the couch, me in a chair, and the coffee table between us laden with notebooks, my cigarettes and a glass of beer, while I change into the set. I call him my trans personality, while it's occurring, occurred to me that he might possibly refer to me the same way. <laughs> in any case, while I'm in trance, Seth dictates his own books to Rob in flawless prose, rolling his vowels with obvious relish and producing such an amount of material that we can hardly keep up with. It was when Seth was dictating his third book, The Unknown Reality, that I became personally concerned with the notion of speaking for the famous dead. As I sat waiting for our usual session to begin, an event occurred 
that surprised us rather uncomfortably. Suddenly I saw a small book in my mind. It was suspended out of space, no, out in space, opened towards the middle. And what bothered me was that I knew that the book was written by William James, the dead psychologist. Rob and I were both disconcerted. While other mediums often claim to be in touch with famous dead personages, I steered away from such areas because they raised so many questions in my own mind, and I just wasn't ready to handle them. The copy in the book was amazingly clear. Though, so after telling Rob what was happening, I began to read aloud in my own voice while Rob took notes. The material itself was excellent, and it's included in full in Psychic Politics, the book I was writing then, along with some other material, which followed immediately afterward. This supposedly came from Carl Jung, who, like Cezanne, was dead and unable to defend himself. Eyebrows raised, Rob continued with his note-keeping. I didn't see a book with the young material. The words just came along with an emotional exuberance and impatience that for some time I found irritating. The emotional fit wasn't quite right. I chafed psychologically. But anyway, there we were, the two of us, not at all ready to believe that I was in direct contact with James or Jung yet faced with this odd experience that shimmered above all other forgotten events of the day. I felt Seth around the whole time, but he never, in quotes, came through. At our next session, though, Rob asked Seth what was going on. Seth not only explained, but used the episode to initiate his interpretation over world views, which appeared in his own book, The Unknown Reality. The concept considerably widens the theoretical framework in which communications from discarnate personalities can be considered. Simply put, and as he mentions somewhat in his own introduction to this volume, Seth maintains that each of us forms a psychic worldview composed of our own feelings, ideas, and beliefs as we encounter our private corner of reality. This view exists on a personal basis, yet it's also used as a bank from which the entire race can be drawn. Later in this book, I'm including some excerpts from Seth on worldviews in general, and specifically on the worldview of Paul Cezanne. Here, I just want to mention that I was familiar with worldviews when Cezanne, when the Cezanne material began, and I knew how our personal reality can expand when we allow it to, because I kept encountering still new instances of the unknown reality, even as Seth continued dictating his own book by that name. I seem to be having experiences at my level that emphasize the aspects of consciousness that Seth was discussing at his level. For example, through events described in psychic politics, I found myself with a psychic library, a library room with books, table, and chair that was transposed, sometimes over the wall of the living room. A library of books that were models for physical ones, books that were to be transcribed at this level of consciousness and formed into new creative versions of themselves. So briefly, when I saw the James material in my mind, I thought, I must be in the library, only I'm reading from the wrong book. <laughs> a 
whole portions of psychic politics came from the library as a complete copy. Only I usually saw my double reading from the book, and the words she read were then, oh, saw my double reading from the book, and the words she read were then transferred to my mind. Hmm. I knew that I could get the entire text of the James book if I wanted but I was uncomfortable, no matter what Seth said about the whole idea of communicating with the famous dead, so I didn't pursue the issue. Yet, all of those experiences seemed to be living proof of Seth's ideas in unknown reality. While he was dictating it, I wrote Psychic Politics, describing many of those events that seemed to spill over from his book into my life, and the worldview of Paul Cezanne sprang into being before politics was even finished. The creative richness meant, among other things, that I'd never done so much typing in my life. When Seth first gave the material on worldviews through Rob, no, when Seth first gave the material on world views, though, Rob and I were also involved in moving to a new house. The whole idea of world views went to the back of my mind. Other issues were connected too, in that the James and Young segments didn't quite gel with me. I was impressed with James's stately prose and emotional integrity. But the time just didn't seem right. I remind myself of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. James seemed too melancholy. Jung, too wearing. In his bursts of exuberance. Too wearing. Hmm. But when the Cezanne material came, over a year later, the fit must have been just right, even though, as you'll see, I didn't agree with all the ideas I found myself recording. But in any case, while Rob and I joked at the table, I was already familiar with Seth's world view and had some limited experience in tuning into them. Yet all of that was in the background of my mind, except for the very fleeting fantasy, which I only remembered later. Nothing about the moment seemed at all significant, and Rob and I each went about our daily chores. Still, I l longed to get Rob a really good book, an extraordinary book on Cezanne, if that was what he wanted. I'm a person of strong loyalty. Rob and I would be married 22 years that coming December 27th. Sometimes, in my more emotional moments, I feel as if I'd more, I'd move heaven and earth to make him happy. Knowing that at the same time, that no one can make anyone else happy. And no one can rightly expect that of anyone else. Certainly Rob doesn't. Anyhow, he's happy rather than unhappy. And who'd want to be conventionally happy, <coughs> excuse me, all the while? I should think it would be boring. <laughs> but anyway, sometimes I feel that way. So part of me must have been going to get the real thing or the closest approximation that I could manage to get. And that part of me must have instantly called upon my knowledge of Seth's world views. I'm sure that this was the emotional impetus that aroused my creative and psychic potentials and directed them in this particular manner, even though all of that must have gone on while I typed psychic polit politics till late in the evening, watched television, and finally went to bed. I woke up just past 3 a.m., restless and unable to go back to sleep. I didn't feel inspired, just irritable. We turned the heat down. It would be chilly and I'd forgotten to put my robe by the bed. Angrily, I snuggled back beneath the covers, but it wouldn't work. I was wide awake. Finally, I got up walking. Uh, I got up waking our cat, Willie. 
who complained loudly and followed me into the kitchen. I made some coffee and instant cereal and took this gourmet feast to my desk and sat down. And then, rather suddenly, I felt like writing. So I put a piece of paper in the tab typewriter just in case I got an idea. And as soon as I did that, I knew I should write the name Cezanne at the top of the paper. I perked up my mental ears, followed the impulse, shrugged, and waited. At the same time, I glanced at the clock. It was 5.30 a.m. Instantly, the first lines of the Cezanne script came into my head. They were neutral, that is, emotionless and clear, as maybe the printed word would be if you could imagine it speaking itself. I didn't feel any presence, but a connection that was definite, unhampered, a new channel, a new open channel through which the words came. I typed as quickly as I could while the heat began to murmur up through the wall registers and the radio beside me went through the current rock tunes, <laughs> news and back again every half hour. I never heard. I kept my mind as clear as a pool, as if the Cezanne material were in some way, some were some kind of exotic fish. I didn't want to frighten away. I even tempered my own excitement so as not to shatter or disturb the clear flow of words now definitely coming from some out there, out there in quotes. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask if this was really Cezanne. It wasn't the time for questions. I did feel a sure sense of accomplishment as if I was using myself right fusing abilities in a way best for me, even if I wasn't consciously sure of all the processes involved. I was riding my own magic. Surely, sports achievers must feel this way too, when they're performing at their best, effortlessly, triumphantly, taking advantage in a clear moment of freedom of all the years of training and work and then suddenly you break three, free and the old laws and records are suddenly broken. The material came steadily for an hour and a half. There was a certain rhythm I discovered in that the sentences were not natural ones for me. They had an unaccustomed feel to them. The syntax all flowed together quite smoothly, for instance, but it had a translated feel, translated in quotes. Huh. Was this because Cezanne would have naturally spoken and written in French? Or was it simply that the concepts were coming from a source that found painting rather than writing a native way of expression? I read the five pages over and shook my head. For some unknown reason, I typed single space, something I never do, and I had to squint because the lamplight reflected so on the white paper. Yet I knew at the same time that the single-spaced material with the typed name Cezanne at the top of the page was somehow the format that presented itself and the way the material wanted to come, wanted to come in quotes. So I wasn't going to change it. Besides this, often Cezanne seemed to be pausing on purpose for effect. I knew I was to insert three dots in such cases, so I did. It was as if Cezanne simply wanted to imply a certain kind of inflection, with which I wasn't familiar. I had no idea if there would be more, though in the back of my mind I thought that, the f that 25 pages or so would be super. I could type it up in a small book and I could give it to Rob for Christmas. Not that I could keep the secret that long. As is my habit when working early, I went back to bed around 7 a.m. And Rob got up at 8, 8, painted, painted all morning, and called me at noon. And while he ate lunch, I had a second breakfast. And then I showed him my Cezanne. Actually, I was excited and somewhat nervous. I painted as a hobby, 
but I never had any instructions. And my painting is about as primitive as you can get. What would a professional artist think of the material? It wasn't anything like taking down Greek. I could understand it well enough, but I couldn't tell if the pages made good art sense or not. I waited, trying not to be impatient, while Rob read what I'd done. Entry number one, December 11th, 1975, 5.30 to 6.50 a.m. <clears throat> Excuse me. The secret lies in the motion captured by the wrist and translated into quick brush strokes, each one sure and fast, even though a minute or an hour may pass between one brush stroke and another. You must know when to strike, those moments when the sun strikes in just such a precise yet reckless fashion. The strokes and the light then skip from one leaf to another, so that all in all, when it is done, the light seems naturally to spread with predetermined suddenness. And the same applies with features in a portrait, so that each brush stroke is quick once the correct intuitive moment for it is deduced. Thus is the color in a way dappled yet hints of a solidarity that is not heavy or overbearing, a solidarity in which motion seems to blur the edges. I form a mental framework upon the bare canvas first and feel it being filled in. The elements I want from the landscape magically transposed, though in my order. The colors cannot be true to nature, only suggestive of it. For in the suggestion, the imagination of the viewer paints the picture that does not abide with nature, but complements it. My landscapes complement their physical models so a portrait should complement the subject in the same way. No attempt at literal duplication, but a subtle focusing and drawing together of elements suggested in the model, but not apparent, perhaps to the normal observer, landscapes and portraits both should attempt to draw from nature its subtler characteristics so that between the painting and the subject there is a give and take and one gains from the other. In color, the artist should not try to outdo nature but to blend into a new synthesis, the divergent hues. To point out some, tone down others, to capture the mood, while being true but not, la not slavishly true or slavishly true, to the subject at hand. Isolation doesn't occur in nature, so that the light in a painting should gently highlight without isolating. Point out without divorcing the main elements from their surroundings. My palette was by many standards subdued, yet the clear illusion of soft light was everywhere present. And even my earth tones were 
dot, 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 lightly weighted. I painted from the center of the leaf outward, modeling the shape of the leaves, light rather than its substance. Light is the source of all objects, and I tried to build up my objects from this presence of light. I built the shape around and about this. I often used an uneven stroke, heavier on the outside of the brush, letting the inside carry or indicate the lighter qualities, particularly in doing leaves and in the strokes of a cheek or ear, the heavier outside pressure carried the shape or form, while the inside lighter pressure gently rebuked too heavy a stroke and added to the motion. This also gave a gentle curving indication to even the, sharp, the harshest angle. The lesser inside pressure also usually carried a barely discernible lighter color. Shape and form emerge out of light, and only light's interplay creates the illusion of form. I do not believe light itself to be illusion, however, but the pulsing inwardness out of which the world world's parts come. I'm going to read that sentence again. I do not believe light itself to be illusion, however, but the pulsing inwardness out of which the world's parts come. The light itself must be molded and the shapes will follow, suggesting themselves as is true in nature. The whole world rises out of light so that it flows through objects uniting them while its subtle gradua gradations the whole world rises out of light so that it flows through objects uniting them while its subtle gradations shadows and nuances also give objects their separate shapes. Those shapes, however, exist because of or in relation to the environment. One shape plays against another and yet complements it. The gentle roundness of an apple is so beautiful itself because of the surfaces about it and its apparent isolation exists only in relation to all of the planes immediately surrounding. These planes will have their implied existence within the fruit's shape also and the inner lines of reference should be understood as connecting, say, the center of each piece of fruit in a still life. I do not mean necessarily that lines should be drawn through the center of an apple's form, connecting it with the other fruits, or that, li that the lines be invisibly drawn through the center of the fruit's gravitational center. Quite different. The fruit's center, in terms of its shape, and its gravitational center may coincide to the untrained eye, but they are never the same. The objects in a still life exist in relationship to their opposing and complementary placements. The same applies to landscapes. A rock on a hillside, in this regard at least, is no different than an apple tilted on a plate. The same movement or near movement or anticipation is implied so that even the most massive solidarity involves 
the titillation of inner acceleration, the motion of the tides is implied in a raindrop. For that matter, any shiny surface moves the eye in the same manner, releasing the objects upon it from a too rigid pose. Nature does not know squalor, and even the muddiest ground, observed carefully, seems to be made almost of glazes, at least of transparencies, one laid upon another, that do not merge in any given layer, yet commingle in a way that confounds the artist's skill. Here, shapes are applied, implied and seem to rise, casting their patterns on the higher ground, as if the roots of a tree, say, are repeated in its branches. The eye cannot follow that kind of reflection, yet I know it is there in my inner vision, and so in my work that's, that is stated. Properly, properly read, read in R-E-A-D, in quotes, properly read, my grounds could as well be skies. Not that no difference is apparent, but that both ground and sky seem to be layered transparencies. Light stretching itself into shapes and forms. Half close your eyes and objects can become cloud formations as well. For example, capturing motions with less solidarity. Clouds being in constant motion can serve as excellent patterns for painting objects. Only the objects differ in holding their shape and position longer from our standpoint. My apples sit solidly on their surfaces, for example, yet they are mobile as clouds, some tilting, some forming, and some past their prime. For such work, timing is of prime importance. The ripeness of a color must be just the correct degree, and the fluidity of the pigments flow on the canvas must not be stilled or impeded by strokes that overdefine or stop the object's implied motion. Therefore, if shape is captured too rigidly, motion is lost and rigor mortis sets in. The fluidity of the object's inner motion, captured with quick strokes, well-timed, will allow for overpainting, as the seasons themselves lay on the colors of a tree bark, while the bark itself remains flexible. The quick strokes themselves, following the hand's flexible motion, give a natural physical rhythm that mimics the wind through the branches. In this way, the body's own spontaneity becomes part of the painting. While the waiting mind knows when to strike with a proper stroke, it's as if light intersects itself at each and every point in space, where there are objects and where there are none. It seems to me that the proper strike of the quick stroke comes when I am suddenly and acutely aware of one of these minute sections, which, taken together, form a curve, whether of hill, cheek, or fruit. 
These are sparkling points. I see them when viewing the landscape. They are ever moving, building up the forms of objects everywhere. Yet, only be selecting a certain area and separating it from another larger one. You can focus upon these light dissections. <clears throat> I believe there's a typo in the sentence. I think it should read, yet only by selecting a certain area and separating it from another larger one, you can focus upon these light dissections, at least clearly enough to use them. Otherwise, you get lost, or I get lost in the light itself and in the other patterns that it also forms, patterns that do not result in objects. These particular patterns connect objects, though, or rather, they are like incipient objects, impressions in space of objects that could exist if they were filled in, filled in in quotes. Normal objects seem to rise from these pre-shapes. Knowing this provides the mystery that any given object in itself, no, <laughs> knowing this provides the mystery that any given object is itself and no other. Yet I'm not saying that objects are interchangeable, only that their identity is a mystery and that one apple is itself and yet implies all others. There are artists who emphasize form, yet never give it life, because they do not understand light, or rather, they do not comprehend it. It cannot be applied to a painting from without. That is, it can't be applied on top of a shape that has been painted without light in each brush stroke. A too heavy bristle brush itself can smother the light elements, regardless of the pigments used. If not applied with a touch as flashing as lightning itself, the heavy pigment is not necessarily responsible, though it can be on occasion. But in a heavy hand at least, the bristles of each brush can do violence by setting up a drag that pulls against the light. I do not mean to suggest wispiness either, for that lacks strength, but the brush has its own edges. Each bristle is alive, and the artist must train the brush itself until it follows the most delicate of his directions. In this way, the hand's nerves affect the brush bristles leaping with their own agility from mental pattern to bristles marks. A heavy mood can be depicted for the lightest of subjects only if mass is properly understood. A massive mountain can appear weightless and illusionary or a blade of grass suggest impending winter and hence imply a mass of weight. I consider the painting of clouds to be excellent training for the execution of clouds, no, for the execution of objects, for clouds are like ever-moving objects and observing them encourages the artist's flexibility and quickens his eye. Here, all gradations of volume, mass, Subtle color and shape are presented in an ever-changing form and motion, seen as it alters its pose. The light above and below the clouds shows clearly the effects of unstable surfaces. The table is actually as mobile as the sky, not that it moves across the room, bunking into other objects, but that under observation, 
it is seen to be composed of layers of light and the interplays of motion between them. Painting clouds and skies increases the artist's dot, 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 capability to see the anticipated light and motion or the motion of light in objects, whatever they are. I only realized this later and then wished that in my earlier years I had practiced more on clouds for they roll or they seem about to roll over the edge of the earth in the same way that an apple might seem to about to roll off a table. It is dot 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 anticipated motion always that is important. The applied brush strokes will not move and no art will disturb a leaf that I have painted one whit. But the entire painting, any painting, must be anticipated, must imply anticipated motion so that everything within it seems about to move. Years later, a viewer looking at a familiar painting will still be led to expect that something will happen within it. And despite all common sense, almost expect one of my apples to roll off the painting or disappear or even appear somewhere else within the painting. Yet the dot, 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 Direction of motion must also be implied. So we have not undisciplined, anticipated motion in which action could turn chaotic, but rather the viewer must be led to perceive an anticipated, directed motion. The apple must tilt in just such a fashion and no other so that if it were to fall, its direction would be predicted. The shadow or the suggested, no, uh, <clears throat> the shadow or shape of the implied future action must be given or suggested in the present position of an object, in this case the apple. I do not want my paintings to depict motion just completed, as in a state of rest, but to suggest the action about to happen, the motion in the period of rest. All paintings are still lifes. The most cleverly painted wave will neither roar nor dash to the shoreline. Yet, the light always splashes anew upon any painting so that it changes in that respect, mirroring to some degree the natural changes of the landscape throughout the days and the seasons. I am still working against the painting's physical still life, trying to impart the off-balance quality that teases the canvas, painting, and frame itself into an illusion of a tilt, a motion, and to impart mobility. A mental whisper is not a shout and does not reach the eardrums of another. So my motion, however craftily presented in a painting, will not make anyone seasick or dizzy. Yet the senses do respond to the semblance. And when a viewer looks at such a painting, his own senses should be suitably enough stimulated so that he imagines the anticipated motion as vividly as he might hear his own name mentally called. He responds, he checks the painting again, and his own seeking for motion reinforces the illusion. All the time Rob was reading, I sat fidgeting. To me, what was strange about the material was that it spoke with such authority 
about a specific craft. And I thought, yeah, but suppose that what it said didn't correlate with the principles of painting at all. Or maybe the material was really so general that any artist would consider it quite rudimentary. Or had I unconsciously picked up Rob's knowledge of art and then again maybe unconsciously couched it as coming from Cezanne? That would certainly make for a lot of unconscious manipulation and would be a valuable demonstration in itself. But it's terrific, Rob said. He was grinning shaking his head with half-serious, half-mocking amusement. It's really good, I said, also half-serious, half-joking. Thank God, I don't care where it came from, as long as it's good. Is there going to be any more, Rob asked. And I had to admit that I didn't have the slightest idea one way or another. I was reassured by Rob's assessments of the material as far as its knowledge of art was concerned. Several times that day, he came into my workroom asking to see the material again and commenting with pleased astonishment about some point or another. And at the same time, I worried about the old after-death bit. And I wondered if I really wanted another manuscript that would involve me in further questions. Cezanne, after all, was an historically known person, a dead one. Did I really want to get involved? I decided to forget the whole affair for a day and see what developed. So that's the end of chapter one. And my goodness, that was pretty interesting. Oh, this one sentence here in this really captured my attention, where uh, she brings through the sentence. I'll read it to you one more time. It's on page 11, in the middle of page 11. The motion of the tides is implied in a raindrop. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it just blew me away when I read it. You know, I didn't get nearly as much out of it the first time I read this book. This, uh, this is fabulous. Because I think what, the first time I read it, I don't think I'd done any painting. Not that, that I'm a painter or anything, you know, I just dabble in this. But this actually, wow, blows me away. Okay, so that was chapter one. And, you know, I know you noticed that I a few times I said dot, dot, dot. <laughs> because, you know, Jane had been talking about dot, dot, dot. And so... I didn't know. Should I just leave a pause, a long pause, and um, imply the dots? Like, does it bug you, or does it bother you if I do dot, dot, dot? Would you rather I just did a long pause? Then it sounds like I'm like I'm stuck reading it or something. I don't know. Anyhow, let me know in the comments below what you like and you know how you want me to continue. I will definitely be continuing. This is so interesting. Anyhow, uh, so thanks for coming. Like and subscribe, as always, and uh, till soon.